Vimeo. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Service will begin in approximately five minutes.
Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. It is good to be in the house of the Lord here today. Amen. We are looking forward to what the Lord has for us here tonight. No big announcements that we need to make, so we're just going to go ahead and go right into our prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you once again for this opportunity to be in your presence. We invite you, Lord, to have your way in this tabernacle, Lord, that you would be high and exalted, and Lord, that you would receive all glory, honor, and praise. We thank you for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord here tonight. Hallelujah. Send it on down. Send it on down. Walking in faith and victory, we're walking in. 
faith and victory. We're walking in faith and victory for the Lord. Our God is with thee. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God. You may be seated here this evening. It is good to be here. Good to have each and every one of you. Uh, just as a reminder, we have uh, been uh, banished to Facebook jail. And uh, so uh, we are not live on Facebook. We are live on Vimeo. We are live on YouTube. And uh, so, but uh, that's all right. We always like to say one monkey don't stop the show. And that's especially applies with the clowns on Facebook. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. Well, we do have some prayer requests that we want to make sure we bring to your attention here this evening. Um, we want to remember Ashley, Heather, and Lori in our prayers this week. So if you will do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Also, if you have an unspoken request, if you'd signify it by raising your hand here today. Let's go to the Lord right now and ask him to touch all of our needs here today. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this opportunity once again to be in your presence. We invite you, Lord God, to have your way in this place. Touch every need, O oh God, both spoken and unspoken. We know, O oh God, that you are more than able. You're willing to touch the very feeling of our infirmities and Lord, we come to you right now and we ask, oh God, that you would move as only you could do. Heal as only you can heal. Lord God, bring salvation, peace, comfort. Whatever the need is, oh God, we lay it all before you, knowing that you care for us, oh God. And we thank you for it. And we will not fail as your people to give you 
all glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. We are continuing our series here tonight on understanding the authority of God. And this is our 11th lesson, second to the last lesson in this series. And tonight we're going to be talking about how to deal with evil people in authority. How to deal with evil people in authority. And uh, the thing about authority is pretty simple. Wherever there is authority, there is an opportunity for evil to come in and corrupt it. And uh, where there is that line of obedience, there is a chance for authority to misuse that obedience to that to their own advantage and so if you'll turn with me in your bibles here this evening to the book of acts chapter 5 verse 28 acts chapter 5 verse 28 and 29 acts chapter 5 28 and 29 says this saying did we not straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name. And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. Now, it is very true that this concept of where there is obedience, there is a chance for evil to corrupt it. Um, so we need to take a little deeper dive and understand how we can deal with this concept of authority being corrupted by evil. Amen? So that's what we're going to do tonight. Father, I thank you tonight for your word. I thank you for this people. I pray, God, that you would help me, oh God, to share what you have given us. Lord, that we would be encouraged, uplifted, and God, that we would come to understand and, Lord, be drawn ever closer to you, I pray, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated here this evening. We need to... Take a look at this concept because when authority gets corrupted, we need to have a measured response to that corruption. We need to be very cautious in how we respond when authority is abused. You see, there is a principle that I believe in, and that is submission is something that is absolute, okay? But obedience is relative. And this is because submission ultimately is about an attitude. Your attitude gives you an attitude of submission. But obedience is more about your conduct, how you live your life, how you respond to certain situations, right? When the... When the Policeman's lights start flashing in your rearview mirror. It's your obedience that makes you pull over. But it's your submission that says, I am going to deal with this in a respectful and honorable manner. And so in the book of Acts, when Peter and John are br brought before the council, the council was angry because a miracle had taken place. Now, it seems silly to you and I that someone would get upset about a miracle. But the thing about absolute power, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it doesn't matter when someone in that absolute position of authority 
see something good, if it's not going their way, then it's something bad. I think we see this very evident in the political sphere. Always amazes me how, for instance, I, I, I use something silly. Okay, well, it's not silly, but but the it, it's a, a very simple, let's say, example. You hear people all the time screaming that ob- abortion is not murder. So therefore, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay? But it's those same people that if a young woman gives birth to that child instead of aborting it and just throws it in a trash can that want that young woman prosecuted for murder. And I'm sitting here going, I thought that wasn't murder. How did it magically become a murder case? And and it's because we don't like the concept of this entity, let's call it, that we can see being disposed of in that manner. But we have no problem with the entity we can't see having its brain scrambled, its skull crushed, and it tore to pieces inside of its mother's womb. That's perfectly acceptable because we can't see it. And, and that's where this absolute authority also, if, if it's something that impacts me, I'm in the absolute authority as the world leader. <laughs> that's my evil laugh, right? But you go against my authority and say, well, you're really not the world leader. You're just a moron. Then guess what? I get upset by that. And that's what's going on in this story. In Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, notice when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. This is what really bothered them. The thing you've got to, whether it's in political circles or religious circles or whatever it is, you've got to look beyond what is presented on the surface to reveal what's really going on underneath. And notice it says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. It wasn't what Peter and John did. It wasn't even the miracle that took place that upset them. It was the boldness of Peter and John that had had them all twisted up. And perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. When an unlearned and ignorant man is able to stand up for himself and see that Use something in our recent past that took place when the unlearned and ignorant masses stand up and say, you know what, this idea that somehow this virus cannot be transmitted at a Walmart, but can be transmitted at a church. When that unlearned and ignorant person says, you know what, that doesn't make any sense, that's really dumb. That's when they get upset. When they see the boldness that you are challenging. And what did we hear during that time? Don't question the science. Right? That's all you ever heard. Don't question the science. It's like you're not learned enough. You don't understand enough. Same thing applies with this whole idea of climate change. Everybody looks around and says, yeah, climate changes all the time. And in fact... We were having Arctic temperatures two weeks ago. Today, I was sitting in here in the church. I turned the fan on because I was hot. Guess what? The climate changed. That's just a natural occurrence. But when you start seeing that and pointing that, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. You need to shut up. See, that's what they do. They cannot stand when the unlearned and ignorant get boldness. And they marveled and took knowledge of them. In other words, they they made a mental note of 
Peter and John, that they had been with Jesus. The only way these men have the courage to stand up and say the things they're saying is because they've been with that man, Jesus. And we can't tolerate that. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, oh, we can't have that. That means this guy's probably going to convert to their side too. We got to get stop that. They could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them which dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. Here's the real crux of the matter. They saw the miracle. They knew it was a miracle. They knew it was genuine. They knew it wasn't fake. It wasn't phony. It wasn't the TV evangelist, you know, spitting on them and spitting on their eyeballs or anything stupid like that. No, it was a genuine miracle. They knew it was. And they said, we've got to do something to stamp this out and quell it before it goes any further. And notice verse 17, but that it spread no further among the people let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor to teach in the name of jesus but peter and john answered and said unto them whether it be right in the sight of god to hearken unto you more than unto god judge yourself basically they're, they're, they're using a tactic that Jesus taught them, the, the Socratic approach, answering a question with a question. Is it, you know, hey, you tell me, is it better for us to obey you or to obey God? For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them, because the people... For all men glorified God for what was done. The thing to notice about this story, church, that's very important. Peter and John were not rebellious in their attitude. It was not a case of, well, you can't tell me what to do, you soup Nazi. Right? It, and even though their actions did seem to be rebellious, they acknowledged the authority that the council had. Okay? And they were very mindful of that authority. But here's the key. Obedience cannot be absolute. Okay? What do I mean by that? Well, take for instance what took place during the, the 40s in Germany. We all know the Nazi regime rose to power and lots of people did lots of bad stuff. What was the argument when the war was finally over and they started trying people for war crimes? What was the main argument that kept being given? I'm not bad. I was just doing what I was told to do. Go back to our most recent occurrence of something very close. I'm not going to say similar, but very close. And that's during the whole COVID scare. Yeah. We got this, you've got to follow the rules. Yeah. And people were being arrested. That there, there was a case, at least one that I know of, in California where a person was arrested. They were the only person on the beach. They were on the beach outside by themselves on the beach. They were arrested for violating COVID lockdown policies. Now, excuse me, that makes no sense. They are out there alone, not with anybody. How are they a danger to anyone? The police did it using the excuse, we're following orders. You cannot go through life simply following orders. You've got to use your brain. God gave you your brain for something other than a hat rack. Okay. 
Remember growing up as a young person, you probably heard words something like this come out of your mother's mouth at some time. Well, if your friends were going to jump off the bridge, would you do it too? Okay. And what mothers and fathers typically are trying to do in that situation is to teach that young person balance in their life. Teach them that just because the crowd is doing something, you don't have to follow. So I'm going to give you, and I know everybody here, you, know, you don't have kids, your kids are all grown at this point, but there's a principle here that I'm going to share with you. In general, authorities are meant to be obeyed. Okay? That's the, that's the general concept. However, there are some authorities that cannot be obeyed. And that is, in particular, dealing with the teachings within the church and in regards to the church. Let's go back and look at Acts chapter 15 for a minute, okay? They put their two cents in the conversation. Everybody got a chance to share their thoughts and their opinions in the conversation. But when it came down to it, James was the head of the church, and James said, this is what we're going to do. He made a decision. And if you pay attention to that passage, in verse 22, the Bible tells us that it pleased the apostles and the elders of the whole church. Now, wait a minute. I thought we were having a discussion just a moment ago. When you have discussions, that doesn't mean everybody agrees with you. That means everybody's sharing different opinions and different ideas and thoughts and, and so forth. But here, the Bible tells us that it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church. What this is basically showing us is that once the decision was made, everybody lined up, okay? Now, it does us good to remember that God grants authority, and when we approach someone of authority, we need to recognize that. Because the authority is coming from God, and God's authority is absolute, okay? But ours is not. Our authority is not absolute. We are delegated authority. God's given us a portion of his authority, whether you're a, a boss on the job, or you're a politician, or even a police officer. God has delegated a certain amount of authority to you. Your authority is not absolute, this means that sometimes you could be in the wrong. So you can't just go about using the excuse, well, I was following orders. When the council told the apostles they could not preach in Jesus' name, they, could, they didn't say you can't preach. They just said you can't preach in Jesus' name. They could have easily said, okay, we're just not going to preach in Jesus' name, which is what a lot of churches nowadays do. Well, you, you can't preach against the rainbow people. And you could submit to that, and you can join the rainbow mafia. But the fact of the matter is, that goes against Scripture. That goes against God's authority then. And so, notice how the apostles approached this situation. Number one, they kept their spirit submitted. They did not say, well, we're going to do whatever we want, bless God. They countered with a question saying, is it better for us to obey you or to obey God? And they didn't argue from that point. They left it up to the council. They, the council now has to answer that question. Is it better to obey you or obey God? That's the benefit of having a uh, Socratic approach. Because then the, the uh, person that you have posed that question to has to answer that question for themselves. And I'll just leave it there for now. I don't want to get off on that. But, so the council 
did not have the authority to mandate how they should preach. The council did have the authority to say whether or not they would be put up. Let's, I'll use an example. They had the authority to say whether or not they would be able to stand up in front of the congregation at the temple. Right? They had that authority. They didn't have the authority to say, hey, when you meet somebody out in the marketplace, you can, you can talk to them, but you can't talk to them in Jesus' name. Right? The disciples did not get mouthy. They did not get arrogant. They didn't get rude or abusive or abrasive. They simply went through the process and said, okay, here's our answer to your challenge. Is it better for us to obey you or God? And then they went back to preaching. They didn't quarrel. They didn't shout. They didn't argue. They didn't dissent. They didn't have a long debate. They just asked a simple question and went on their way. They didn't make a bold proclamation. Well, bless God, we're going to do whatever we want to do. Right. Nothing like that. Take a look at Acts chapter 23, beginning in verse number 1. Acts chapter 23, beginning in verse 1, says this, And Paul, earnestly beholding the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded them that stood by to smite him on the mouth. Then Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for thou for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? So let me back up and just give you a little synopsis of what Paul is saying here. Paul is standing here, just like James and John were, being pulled before the council. And the high priest told one of the servants to smite Paul. Paul got angry. Now, he had some justification because according to the law, you could not strike a prisoner. It was against the law when you were questioning them to abuse them like that. So this commandment that this high priest Ananias gave to smite Paul was against the law. And so Paul got mad. Okay, Sometimes we lose our cool, don't we? And he said, and he calls him a name. He says, you're a whited wall sepulcher. And he says, why are you commanding him to smite me when you know it's against your own law? And they that stood by got angry at Paul and said, why are you reviling the high priest. And now Paul realizes he lost his cool. So Paul pulls it back, calms down, and says, I wist not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, Thou shalt speak evil, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. And he's saying, Look, even at this moment, Paul is convicted for losing his temper. And he pulls it back and he says, look, I just wish he wasn't the high priest because the Bible tells us not to speak evil of those in authority. Someone who has the revelation of God's authority will be soft in their speech, not harsh. They will be more willing to pull themselves back from the brink. I could imagine that if Paul wouldn't have pulled himself back, this, could have, this whole situation could have escalated even further and out of control, right? Sometimes God's delegated authority will be in conflict with God's direct authority. You say, what do you mean? That's because God's delegated authority is delegated to a person. And guess what? Persons are weak, they're fallible, and they make mistakes. Okay? This is why a person can render submission without obedience. Obedience, once again, is related to your conduct. It is relative. Okay? 
But submission is related to your heart and the condition of your heart. In this story, Paul is submitting to the authority of the council, even though the obedience, he rises up and he gets angry with them, right? Now, only God deserves or should get your absolute unqualified obedience, okay? He's the only one. Anyone under God gets what's called qualified obedience. And what that means is even in my case, being the pastor of this church, you give me qualified obedience. What does that mean? It means as long as what I teach, as long as what I say does not go contrary to God's order, which is the only absolute obedience you have, you submit. But as soon as I step outside of God's word, I'm no longer in his authority, and thus you're not under my authority. Okay? If you are ever put in the position where you have to choose, like the apostles, between God and man, God should always win out. No matter what the consequences. You think about even with the, the three Hebrew boys, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were even told, look, you messed up. You didn't bow down. We're going to play the trumpets again. If you bow down, all will be forgiven. And they said, we ain't bowing down. And they marched them into the furnace. And the, my favorite part of that story is they heated the furnace up seven times hotter, right? So that when the soldiers begin marching them to the furnace, the heat coming off of the furnace is so hot, the soldiers collapse. Does that mean that the three Hebrew boys go running off? Hey, we're free. Who God freed us? No, they marched themselves into the furnace. They were so confident in their obedience to God and his word that they knew we're going to march in there and one way or the other, we're coming out. Okay? So let's look at some, some examples of this, this principle of choosing between God and man. Okay, The midwives and Moses' mother both disobeyed their king, Pharaoh. But they were women of faith. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 16, and he said, when ye do the office of the midwife, To the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools. If it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then shall he live. She live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as Egyptian women. For they are more lively and are delivered ere the midwives come to them. In other words, they basically told a fib to the king. And they said, look, the, 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 the Hebrew women, man, as soon as these kids, as soon as it's time for delivering, before we can ever arrive with the ambulance, the babies popped out. Therefore, God dealt with the midwives and the people multiplied and waxed very mightily. And it came to pass because of the midwives feared God that he made them houses. Okay. So in, that's one case. Now another case of this is with Peter and the apostles, right? Again, our verse, verse 29 of chapter 5, when Peter and the other apostles answered, said we ought to obey God rather than men. Okay. Another case of this situation is found with Daniel in Daniel chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, notice this, Daniel knew the law had been passed, okay? And he went into his house, and his windows being open in the chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees, 
three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Daniel was not doing this out of rebellion. He was simply doing what he had always done. And so Daniel is disobeying the king. He knows he's doing it, but he's like, God, I have followed this my whole life. And everybody knows it. They've seen me. And these people that, that got this law passed, they've seen me. They knew it. And so, God, I'm going to keep praying. You look at Joseph, the story of Joseph and Mary when Jesus was born. Okay? In Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse number 12, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, the king, they departed into their own country another way. So here we even have the wise men not obeying. Okay, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth unto Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And of course, I've already mentioned this, but we'll, we'll go ahead and read it together in Daniel uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Daniel chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said, un, said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. What they're saying is, we're not, we're not mincing words. We're not doing the Potomac two-step. We're going to be straight up with you, king. Okay, If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. They weren't being disrespectful. They weren't being belligerent. They were simply saying, look, king, we're going to answer you very plainly. Okay? God is able to deliver us. If he chooses to deliver us, fine. If not, we're still not going to bow down to the idol. Okay? Sometimes, church, what am I saying? Sometimes you have to take a stand for your faith. And as we draw closer and closer to these end of times, the end days, the end of the age, the end of the church age, we are going to be forced to make a stand. Yes. We have been a very fortunate and blessed people living in this country. We have never had to make the commitment that other Christians have had to make for their faith. But there is coming a time, mark my word, when we are going to be forced to stand up like the three Hebrew children and say, whatever happens, happens. If you're going to set me a light in your garden as a candle, then so be it. I'm going to be a candle. The reason there are so many weak saints is because our Christianity has not cost us anything. Right. It's all just a game to us. It's all just a, a social club. It doesn't mean anything. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 36. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 36, says, And others had trial. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. It, that was going on over there in those foreign lands somewhere. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. 
and they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Despite everything they did, they never got the Holy Ghost. They never got to experience the sheer joy that you and I got to experience. This begs the question, can your experience with God and love for God walk you through the tough stuff that's about to come? The worst we've ever had to deal with is a, a woman having an unsaved husband or, you know, maybe an unsaved or a backslidden child. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 14. 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 14 says this, But to the rest speak I, not the Lord, if any brother hath a wife that, ha that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. In other words, the apostle is saying, if you have an unsaved spouse and they want to live with you and continue living with you, don't divorce them, okay? And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children or else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Now, the problem comes is if the, the, the husband asks something of a Christian wife that is not of her choosing. Okay? She didn't like it. She should obey to the point of sin. Right? Once it gets to that point of sin, that's a different story. That's going outside of God's delegated authority. Same thing with the children. They have to obey as long as the request is not against God's word. Now, if the request does end up being out of God's word, just like with the three Hebrew children, just like Daniel in the lion's den, God will deliver you out of these situations if you're willing to take the stand. And the same principle works in the home that works at school or on your job. Romans 1 and 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. What God is calling us to, church, in this end time is he's calling the church to courage. It's kind of like ben, Benjamin Franklin said during the Revolutionary War. He said this, if we don't hang together, we shall most assuredly hang separately. Martyrdom was the majesty of the early church. You know, I've, I've used this example several times, and that was uh, during, I don't remember which Roman emperor, but one of the Roman emperors would light his gardens and his paths with Christians. And you say, how did he do that? Well, he tied them up to a stake, and then he would set them on fire. Human body is mostly fat, so it makes a really good candle. Ignite it and let it burn. And that's how he lit his garden. That's how he lit his walkways. Christian candles. You and I cannot be weak in this end time. We have to stand strong. And God will see us through. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 through 18. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 
verses 8 through 18, says this. Be not thou, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor me as his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Look at verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed. Jump over to verse 16. And the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. You see, we cannot find ourselves in a place where we're ashamed of who we are. We cannot be ashamed of our birthright. If the chains happen, if the prison doors close, we cannot be ashamed of that. That's a mark of greatness. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 through 4 says this, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't remember anybody telling me that being crucified and choking to death on your own bodily fluids was a real pleasure. But it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. In other words, he's saying, it, when you face the struggles, when you face those trials, when, you, when, when everything's coming against you, think about what he went through. And be encouraged because you won't faint if you realize he was able to do this for you. You have not resisted unto blood, meaning you haven't resisted to your own death yet, striving against sin. Colossians 3 and 15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. You want to know why the church is told by the apostle to be thankful, to remain thankful, despite everything that they were going through? Take a look at Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Here's why the church is told to be thankful. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. In other words, they had been introduced to him. Right? But they didn't acknowledge him. Neither were they thankful but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Unthankfulness is that fertile seed ground for deception. It gives the enemy an opportunity to plant the seed of deception in your life. And you cannot be unthankful. All right. How can we tell if someone is obedient in their life? If someone is truly obedient to authority? Well, once a person has had this concept of authority and God's authority revealed in their life, begin, they begin to look for it everywhere in life. They began to see all the various ways that God has delegated authority in other people and other situations. That person is going to be someone who is soft-hearted. They're not going to be harsh. They're not going to be abrasive and hard with people. That type of person is not afraid to be wrong. It doesn't you know, if I'm wrong, well, I'm wrong, right? You look at the Apostle Paul when he got upset with the 
high priest. He, he backed down. Was he in the right? Yeah, he was in the right. He shouldn't have been slapped. But when challenged, he said, you know what? I, I, I need to tone this back a bit, okay? Truly obedient people are almost afraid of making an error. They don't want to overstep those bounds or they don't want to be obnoxious and they don't want to be unruly or, or anything like that. And so those type of people typically aren't going out of their way looking to be an authority of, over other people. You do have certain types of people that they have to be in charge. But that person who understands God's authority, they don't have to be in charge. They're perfectly willing to let someone else be in charge. And usually what ends up happening, they are that reluctant leader. They, they are chosen and selected and they're put in that position and they go, okay, well, I, I will serve the best I can, right? That's, that's their attitude. They don't walk around with this high and mighty attitude that says, I have a word of the Lord for you. There are some people in this world that have a word from God every time they turn around. Quite honestly, when somebody comes up to me and says, Pastor, I got a word from God for you, I cringe. I learned that from my pastor, quite honestly. Because usually when somebody's got a word for you, yeah, it's probably not coming from God. <laughs> usually the person that has a true word from God doesn't have to announce, hey, I got a word from the Lord for you. I'll say, hey, can I share something with you? They don't have to speak for God. They just speak and God speaks through them. They don't, they're, that, they're not that type of person that has to be right. And, oh, you've got to see me as this super spiritual person. They, they, that's, not their, that's not what they're looking for. They, they don't have to have the last word in every argument. They just... They just want the peace and, and they want to be under authority. A person under authority will learn discretion. In other words, they learn when to keep their mouth closed and when to open it. They learn when it's best just to bite their tongue. You know, quite often what's really hard about biting your tongue, sometimes you end up biting it off. <laughs> you're like, oh, I really want to say something here. <laughs> oh, oh, I have to sew that back up here in a little bit, put that back on. Because we can, we can open our mouth and we can insert our foot. And you can even be right. Just like the Apostle Paul. He was right. He shouldn't have been slapped. But he had to bite his tongue. A person under authority learns that discretion. A person under authority will end up getting sensitive towards rebellion around him. When, he's, when he senses that rebellion, they're like, Ooh, I got the Holy Ghost EBGs. That's, 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 I want to get away from that. that that's scary. You, you get this attitude, Ooh, I don't want to go near that because lightning might strike, right? <laughs> and honestly... Only a truly submitted person can lead others effectively because they have to have submission in their life in order to lead other people. Otherwise, they're just putting on a show. It's all fake. It's all phony. It's all uh, for, the, for the, the, the look of the camera, so to speak. Now, within the church, especially the apostolic church, you're going to find very little outward disobedience. Most of the time, the disobedience is inward. And quite honestly, I'm going to close with the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Because this, this really would be my prayer for the church of the living God in this end time. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse number 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, 
beseech you, beseech you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye were called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up unto high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the working of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Why? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about, sorry, there we go, with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lay, lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth, in love, may grow up in him, in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Stand with me this evening. Father, I thank you today for who you are.